Hello and welcome to Game Shack. And yes, we are talking about the Sega Game Gear. Oh my gosh. You know, I'm not real excited about this episode yet. But being the bipartisan gamer that I am, I'm willing to give it a shot. And with episodes like this, Joe, open the thing up, show us what it's all about, talk about it for a minute, and we'll get moving. Why play your portable video games in black and white when you can live in a world of vivid color with the Game Gear by Sega? Launched in late 1990 in Japan and in 1991 in most other places, the Game Gear was Sega's first entrance into the portable market. Featuring a comfortable horizontal design, the Game Gear also had a backlit screen that, in many situations, was almost visible. Based on the Master System hardware, the Game Gear featured an 8-bit Z80 CPU with the same sprite and sound capabilities, but in stereo. The resolution was the same as Nintendo's Game Boy, but instead of four shades of gray, it had 4,096 different colors, even more than the 16-bit Genesis. There's even an adapter that lets you play Sega Master System games on the go. It ran on six AA batteries, which could last between three to five hours. Optional accessories like the rechargeable battery dildo helped to alleviate the short battery life. Like many electronics of the time, Game Gears were made when bad capacitors were in widespread use, so a full replacement of the capacitors in each unit is recommended. All in all, 363 games were released and over 10 million Game Gears were sold worldwide. All right, man, that was really good overview. Very funny, like usual. Um, but as we do with system episodes, it's all about the games. The games. And the good thing is, is that we were able to procure an RGB modded game gear. So we're going to be playing these on a real game gear. So let's just shut the hell up yeah. and get on with it. I want to play games. Ristar was released to the system in 1995. This version shares similarities to its Genesis cousin, but it's also fairly different. The main gameplay is the same, where you traverse levels using your long arms and hands to help you get around. You also use your hands to grab enemies and destroy them, and also treasure chests which you can open for items. I like the idea of Ristar using his hands to grab everything, but after he headbutts them, he bounces back a small distance. This always worries me because I felt I was going to fall off platforms. Other than that, the controls are great and it feels pretty good controlling this little star thing. The level design is good and there's usually many ways to get around a level. If you're into collecting, there's tons of stars for you to collect in each area. 100 of them will give you a free life. Definitely collect a few hundred of these because the game's difficulty is above average and you'll absolutely be dying a few times. Still though, it's a decent title and if you can find it cheap, I think it's worth it. Here's Sonic Drift, and being a fan of Sega's quality racing games, I was pretty excited to try this. The fun, of course, is in the Chaos GP, and you can choose from one of four racers. Besides looks, there's no difference in the way these guys handle. Speaking of handling, it's pretty bad. The controls feel sluggish at times, and when you're going around corners, it likes to wing you to the outside of the track. You can, of course, overcome this by drifting around corners, but it takes a lot of practice. And if you don't drift, then you can forget about winning, it just won't happen. Along the tracks are icons you can run over that will activate instantly. Things like invincibility and a speed boost. Oh, and you can also collect rings. Each character has a special ability when using them. These come in a few different forms, such as a speed boost or the ability to jump. The tracks are decent in design, but the backgrounds are pretty lackluster and they really didn't do anything for me. This is an okay racer, but I really can't recommend it. but I can recommend Sonic Drift 2. The sequel is light years ahead in quality. Everything feels like it was overhauled. This time around, you can pick from seven racers. The most notable upgrade is in the control department. Your car actually controls really well. You don't get thrown off the side of the track at corners now, and the drifting is even easier. Your car also doesn't feel sluggish, and you actually feel like you're in control. The tracks that you race on are really well designed. Not only do they have lap tracks there, but there's also non-lap tracks, which are a nice addition. The graphics this time around look great. There's more variety and now even stuff outside the road which makes it all look more interesting. 
Again, there's power-ups that you can collect on the tracks. This time around, you can save them and use them when you feel the time is right. There's also a lot more obstacles on the tracks which may or may not slow you down. Even the music sounds much better with more variety. If you're gonna play a Sonic Drift game, be sure it's part two. Want an RPG? Well then how about Axe Battler, a legend of Golden Axe? Yes, that's right, one of several Golden Axe legends. I imagine, I don't know. Anyway, this takes place after the hack and slash beat em ups from what I gather from the story. The Golden Axe has been stolen by the Evil Army. Yes, that's what they're called, the Evil Army. You, as Axe Battler, must embark on a quest to retrieve it. As you wander around the overworld, you'll get into random battles. These battles are performed from a side view, kind of like the Adventures of Link. I mean, it's not menu driven, it controls exactly like an action game. If you defeat the enemy, you get vases. Vases not only power your magic, but they're also the game's currency, so obviously you're gonna want all of them you can get. Be careful in battle though, because if you get hit even once, you lose the battle. You'll eventually make your way to caves and other special areas. The game turns into kind of an action platformer here with the same rules as the random battles. Well, except that now you can get hit multiple times if your life bar allows. The towns allow you to rest and get a password which you'll need to continue. And the good news is that the password is really short and easy. However, the random battle encounter rate is ridiculously high and it gets very frustrating. Overall, it's a somewhat decent RPG that could definitely be a lot worse. Want a turn-based RPG? Oh, cool. Then how about Defenders of Oasis? In this one, you play as the prince and your kingdom is under siege. Now it's up to you to save it and possibly even the entire world. The battles here are random and they take place on a plain gray background. They're also very, very slow. But they're also fairly simple and easy to manage. However, you're gonna need to grind quite a bit at the start of this one. In fact, you might want to grind every chance you get during the game because new enemies will often be much tougher than you are. You'll eventually get others to join you, like this genie. Of course, you can buy and sell items and equipment just like you'd expect. One unique thing is that this game features an autosave. If you die in a battle, the save will start you off right before that battle takes place. It's good if you know this before you start playing, otherwise you're going to freak out when you can't find anywhere to save. Other than that though, it's fairly cookie cutter, but it's definitely not bad. Okay, let's check out Fantasy Star Gaiden. This was only released in Japan, but it has an English translation patch. I played this briefly in the Analog NT Mini episode, and now I'm playing it on a real Game Gear. This takes place after the first Fantasy Star game, but before the second in a nearby star system from what I'm able to gather. Combat is turn-based, but unfortunately you can't see your stats on screen during a battle except before you make a command. Anyway, you are Alec. You and Mina are off to find your dad who was attacked and save the entire world in the process. Unfortunately, many things conspire to bring this game down to the point of being downright annoying. First of all is the grinding. You have to grind a ton in this game, more than I have in any RPG ever. The battles are really quick, but gaining levels isn't. Then there's the random battle encounter rate. Hell, you'll be lucky to take three steps before getting into another battle. Lastly is the sound. Not only is the music very high-pitched and annoying, but every time you press the button, the game makes a ding sound. Sad to say that I can see why this one didn't make it out of Japan. You're not missing much. Another Japan-only game with a fan translation is Sylvan Tale. This one is an action RPG that might remind you a bit of Secret of Mana. You're off to rescue the land to start out and you have your sword as well as the ability to push and pull things. Man, you're not even trying to save the entire world, or, or are you? I damn well better be. I mean, can you imagine if I was just trying to save a country or a continent or something? I mean, that's not worth anyone's time. You encounter towns with clues and labyrinths with puzzles. And these labyrinths can be fairly clever in their puzzles and they're always fun. 
Beating the boss of the labyrinth usually gets you a new ability. And of course, this new ability opens up new areas to explore, like the faster sword slash here which can mow down leaves to open new doorways, or even the ability to turn into a mermaid to swim across water. The graphics are really good and the game moves at a brisk pace, if you run. The music is also extremely enjoyable. This game is just loads of fun to play and it's sad that it never got released elsewhere. You could probably fumble your way through it in Japanese, but either way, this game is highly recommended by me. Let's check out Deep Duck Trouble released in 1993. We talked about this Sega-developed Disney game on our Master System episode. It's such a great game that I want to mention the Game Gear version. At the beginning, you can choose which order you want to tackle the game's four levels. Each level is divided into two parts, which result with Donald running away from something to save his little duck behind. While this is a great port of the Master System version, I feel that it's slightly lacking in controls. I had a harder time controlling this version. I don't know what it is, but there's been a few times that I've felt button presses weren't recognized. Anyway, the game is still loaded with charm and I just love all of Donald's animations. If you own a Game Gear, don't miss out on this great title. Another great title starring Donald Duck is The Lucky Dime Keeper starring, uh, Donald Duck. In this one, you're off to rescue your nephews and Uncle Scrooge's lucky dime from Magicka Dispel. Donald starts off his platforming adventure with a big hammer for a weapon. It's quite useful in dispatching enemies, but he can also get a deadly frisbee. This is even better since you can throw it and don't have to be standing almost on top of your enemies to hit them. The platforming is fun and the levels are designed fairly well. The music is also enjoyable for what it's worth. Donald has lots of animations, which I always find to be a plus, and this time around there's actually boss fights at the end of levels. These are typically pretty easy, but they're still entertaining. While we're at it, let's take a look at a couple Disney games starring Mickey. Here's Land of Illusion, which is the second game in the Illusion series. Mickey's off on another adventure to retrieve a stolen crystal and save a village. Your main form of attack is your butt stomp, which if you played any of the Illusion games should be sick in nature by now. Mickey can also lift up many objects. He can throw blocks at enemies, he can throw treasure chests for items, and springs to help him get to higher places. The game isn't all straightforward and there will be some backtracking through previous levels once you meet certain requirements. The gameplay is good, but if I have one complaint it's that it doesn't have freely scrolling levels when you have to move vertically. Otherwise it's just fun to play. With 14 levels, good graphics, and a decent soundtrack, it's something I think you should check out. And here's the last game in the Illusion series, Legend of Illusion. Things were switched up a bit in this one. You can still jump on enemies' heads, but the butt stomp's been taken out. However, they did add the ability to throw soap at your enemies. You have an unlimited supply and it does a really good job of killing. Who knew soap could be so dangerous? And of course, you can still pick up other objects and use them as weapons. The game is completely linear and there's no backtracking at all. It's also the easiest game in the series and you won't have much trouble blazing right through this one. That's fine though as it's a great game. It looks great and there's even a few areas with some parallax scrolling. I was really impressed with this. They even added a shoot 'em up stage to break things up a bit. It's simple, but of course it's still fun. Again, another quality title that everyone should play at least once. All right, we're back, Dave. I'm kind of enjoying the Game Gear a little bit more than I thought I would. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I am too. I really don't know how to feel about it, but I am enjoying it. But let's just keep going. we got a lot more games to talk about. Let's do it. Oh, hell yes. Green Dog, the beached surfer dude. Someone gave this game to me at a convention a few years ago. I didn't even have a Game Gear, but now I'm finally able to plug it in and play it. And it's every bit as amazing as you'd expect. 
and hopefully you're not expecting much. It's basically a simplified port of the Genesis version, but come on, how can you simplify such awesomeness? Yeah, it's got some crappy controls, bad hit detection, and runs incredibly slow, but who the hell doesn't love all that? Each stage is divided into two segments. In the first segment, you wander through an area attempting to kill creatures that are all very, very difficult to kill. You can even collect food from some of them. Make it to the end of this and you go inside some ancient ruins. There are two types of these. The first type you wander around defeating enemies and avoiding traps and you eventually fight a boss. The second type you just need to make it to the end while thrashing on your wicked skateboard, dude! Did you just cringe a little listening to me say that? Good. What's especially neat about this game is that you need to pause it to see your life meter. You never know how you're doing unless you're willing to interrupt the game to find out. They did manage to pull off some nice parallax scrolling in a few areas, but this really slows the game down. The music is also incredibly simple, and they didn't try very hard porting it over. But hey, what can I say? It's Green Dog! Let's check out Alien Syndrome. This is a quick and easy port from the Master System, right? Nope. This one was completely remade by Sims and it's a hell of a lot better as a result. This one actually has scrolling and a lot more weapons to choose from. It takes a few liberties from the arcade. For example, now you're able to power up your weapons a bit. You also have to shoot doors open now to gain access to new rooms. The stage music is all new and it does kind of lose its sense of foreboding, but it's an interesting change nonetheless. The boss fights are still fairly difficult. What else can I say, really? It's Alien Syndrome, and it's not half bad. Gunstar Heroes even got a port to the Game Gear, but only in Japan. It was brought to the system by M2, and at first it looks like a really good port, and in many ways it actually is. The entire first stage is here along with all of the enemies you've grown to know from the 16-bit version. Hell, even the bosses are here! But this is just the first stage. After that, the game starts getting some cuts. Like here in the second stage, for example, you're riding around on some sort of personal helicopter thingy instead of a little cart on the ground and the ceiling. This stage is super short and it's mostly just a 7 force boss fight. And this is kind of tough to do in your slow ass personal helicopter. But I do find it impressive that most of his forms are here. Other stages are altered slightly, like here where you're climbing up. Now you can move all over the screen instead of just on the left side. In the beginning, you can choose from the first three levels. That's right, stage four is completely gone. That was the dice stage. I'm okay with that, screw that stage. The shooter stage is gone too. What is here, though, is tons of flicker and slowdown, making it frustrating if you're used to the 16-bit version like I am. However, I do like that they have some parallax scrolling here and there. And the music is decent, with some stereo effects. But it's kind of hard to recommend importing this unless you're a die-hard Gunstar fan. All things considered, though, it's amazing what they were able to squeeze in here. This is Coca-Cola Kid only released in Japan where they love Coca-Cola. You are the Coca-Cola Kid and damn it you need some Coke! You'll do anything to get that delicious taste of Coca-Cola. Where is it? Coca-Cola isn't just a drink, it's a lifestyle and these enemies are discriminating against you. Where is that delicious Coca-Cola? I'm gonna tear this damn town apart to get a Coke! You gotta run through two big stages in each area to get all of the Coke that you can. Who are you? Get the hell out of my way! I'm on my way to get a Coke! Then there's a boss trying to keep your Coca-Cola from you, so yeah, you've got to kick his ass. Oh, I just freaking love Coke! The power of Coca-Cola allows you to cling and jump off of walls in order to get all the Coke in town. Get this, you can even ride a skateboard. Wow. Enjoy Coca-Cola, bitch. Here's Fantasy Zone Gear released in 1992. This is a cool game because it's almost completely different from the other games in the series. Yes, that means new music and new levels which is totally awesome. 
One cool thing is the amount of stuff that's crammed on the screen a lot of the time. Of course, this results in a lot of slowdown and sprite flicker, but what are you going to do? Because of these issues, the game is no walk in the park and actually is really tough. Also, the crappy hit detection makes the game that much harder. Your best bet is to go to the shop as early as possible and buy things that'll help you out. Like guns that'll shoot both forwards and backwards. Or auto fire and all the extra lives that you can. This will help, but be careful because once you die, all these nice weapons will be gone. One thing that I wish would have made it to the handheld version is a map showing you where the bases are that you need to destroy. Despite its issues, I was still able to have a good time with this one. Streets of Rage was released on the handheld in 1992. In this one or two player game, you can pick from only two characters, Axel and Blaze. The game plays pretty well once you figure out the best way to kill your enemies. Regular punches and kicks are hard to pull off because once you get close to your enemies, you automatically put them into a hole. From here, your only option is to throw them. So yeah, for most of the game, you'll be throwing everyone around instead of punching them. There's more than a few throw moves, so it doesn't get too mundane. If you do get a hold of the pipe though, it's devastating to everyone who comes your way. There's specials in this game, but you don't get to choose when to use them. They're found when you break boxes or whatever and take effect immediately. The music was done by Yuzo Kashiro and it's good for the Game Gear, but it's a far cry from the amazing Genesis soundtrack. Still, I beat this game the first time I played it and I did enjoy it. A year later, Streets of Rage 2 was released. Again, this is a one or two player title with a link cable and you can choose one of three playable characters. And again, the game controls pretty well. This time around, you can actually punch your enemies when you want to and throw them when you want to. Each character also has their special moves and I really didn't have a problem pulling them off consistently. Actually, Axel's Grand Upper was almost a go-to move for me since it really kicks some ass. The music again is by Yuzo, but all it makes me want to do is hear the Genesis soundtrack. If there's one problem this game has, it's cheap enemies. They can keep knocking you down, leaving you no chance to recover or fight back. It's just poor programming on Sega's part, but it doesn't make the game unplayable or even unenjoyable. If you have a Game Gear, I hope you have these two titles. GG Alest is a vertical shooter released only in Japan, and GG stands for Game Gear. This is a pretty fun shooter. There's a few different weapons to collect, and you're always firing two different types at the same time. You can power up your normal shot by collecting these little pea chips that fly out of some enemies. Your secondary weapon can be one of a few different things, but I like the laser the best. These can be powered up by collecting the big P icon. <laughs> big P. When you die, your weapons power down a level. It plays smoothly, and there is a little bit of slowdown, but that's not really that surprising. There's even some bonus levels that play like Galaga, only really, really easy. In fact, the entire game is kind of easy. It picks up around level 5 or 6, but it won't take you too long to finish this one. The visuals are pretty good for the system and take advantage of the Game Gear's wide color palette. The music is superb and features excellent use of stereo. Its sequel is called Power Strike 2 and it even got released in Europe, just not North America. This is a different game than Power Strike 2 that's on the Master System. It plays a lot like GG Alest, but now you get to pick your weapon at the start of the game. You also have a bomb at your disposal. This one's also a lot more difficult. The first stage here is harder than any stage in the original game. There is a lot more going on and everything is moving so much faster. On a really positive note, they sure as hell seem to fix the slowdown issues with this one. You can power yourself up to ridiculous proportions and once you do, the game becomes much easier. This one will still take a lot more effort to beat though. The graphics have improved a bit though, I don't think that the music is as good. I mean, it's definitely not bad though. And good luck to you if you're playing this on the blurry ass Game Gear screen and not on a TV like I am.
GG Doraemon is the best Doraemon game on the system. You know what GG stands for? You already know. You play as a weird blue cat thing and your goal in life is to find the exit of whatever stage you happen to be on. Along the way, you'll open up boxes or crates or eggs and they'll have these weird chips in them. Some boxes will even have power-ups like this gun which stuns enemies. And your enemies all seem to be robots lifted straight out of the Mega Man universe. You kill them for good by bouncing on top of them. Be careful though because one hit and you are dead. But if you have a weapon, you're allowed to take an extra hit. When you do, you'll lose that weapon. On the surface, the game is pleasant and controls well. The graphics are extremely colorful, producing colors that the Master System and even the Genesis can't. The music is bouncy and fun. But don't let the aesthetics fool you, the game is not always simple. There aren't a ton of worlds here and they each have three areas plus a boss fight. But what I really do like though is that each and every area looks different than the last. I often get bored in games like Sonic where each area looks the same until you get to a completely new zone. I just wish that the music here changed as often as the graphics. Sometimes you'll even be swimming. By the way, if you're playing on the crappy Game Gear screen, these nasty blue lines appear as transparent water. Other times, you'll even be flying! This is a pretty good game for the system that never made it out of Japan. All right, man, this thing is actually pretty dang cool. I mean, it's not Game Boy cool, but it's it's starting to approach that level. You know, I didn't really get into the Game Gear back when it was new because at the time the Genesis was, what, one or two years old? Yeah. And I was like, this is a step back. Yeah. I don't want to play with this. This, yeah. this is like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a 16-bit guy. <laughs> but now that I play this, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of liking it. Yeah. And we're not done, so let's get back to it. This is Shinobi, or as the title screen calls it, the GG Shinobi. And GG stands for, well, Joe already told you. This is a completely new game in the series with Joe Musashi. Instead of rescuing hostages all throughout a level, you must rescue other Shinobis. At the beginning, you can tackle four levels in whatever order you want. Once you make it through, you fight a boss who's actually one of the Shinobis you're trying to rescue that's been put under a spell. Once they're back on your side, you can switch between them at any time while playing. This is great, since each Shinobi has his own type of attack. You want some ninjutsu? Well, then you've got it. Once you collect icons, you'll be able to let loose a screen-clearing attack. The game is really fun and it's tough, but what makes it even more fun is the soundtrack done by Yuzo Koshiro. The gameplay, action, and music really bind together to make a highly enjoyable experience. If you like what you see, then you can get this game on the 3DS eShop and it's definitely worth it. Shinobi 2, or the GG Shinobi 2, was released a year later in 1992. Similar to the first game, you can tackle levels in whatever order you want. Again, as you progress through the game, you gain the ability to play as other colored Shinobis, each with his own weapon and special. I like the green one as it reminds me of Revenge of Shinobi with his double jump and being able to shoot a bunch of shurikens down on his enemies. This time around, you have to collect crystals as well to move forward in the game. These are hidden in each level and are a bitch to find. Basically, it's just one more thing to do to make the game a bit longer than it really is. Still, it's fun and it might be a touch easier than the first game on the portable. The control is great and switching between shinobis and using your ninjutsu is really easy to do. Again, the music feature is Yuzo Koshiro and it's really well done. Sadly though, this one didn't make an appearance on the eShop. Here's Panzer Dragoon Mini. This Japan-only title was released in 1996, which was at the end of the system's life over there. This is part of Sega's Kids Gear line of games, so it should be easy, right? Well, it is easy. It plays very much like Space Harrier, but with a lot less action. You pick one of three dragons, and off you go. You have your normal shot, and of course the lock-on shot, which is a huge part of the series. When you lock onto an enemy and release the button, they just explode. No tracers or any effect, I mean, they just die. There's only a few enemies, besides bosses, that'll take more than one hit from a lock-on shot. The action is really slow. A few enemies pop on screen and you kill them and wait a second, and then more enemies pop on screen and again die with little resistance. 
Do this for a bit and then you'll get to a mid boss. Once he's very easily dispatched, you fight a few more enemies and then fight a very easy end boss. Did I mention this game was a kid's title? The best thing this game has going for it is its music, which is actually pretty enjoyable. Otherwise, it's quite a boring game and you should stick with one of the Saturn games. Road Rash is a really good port of the Genesis game. In this one, your goal is to win races by any means necessary and usually that means beating up the other racers. You also need to avoid traffic which is all over the place. And be sure not to get caught by the Popo, you can beat them up as well. For such a drastic difference in the hardware, this really doesn't look much different than the 16-bit original. The frame rate isn't much lower, the hills are still there and the game feels very complete. Even the music is really good, though it's all in mono. Granted, the Genesis version was in mono as well. Rob Hubbard, do you even know about stereo? I don't think Rob did the Game Gear version though. This is a good one to pick up for the Game Gear. The Game Gear even got a version of Space Harrier. They tried to make it look original, but honestly it's just a sprite hack of the Master System game. A really bad sprite hack. I knew this even back when this version was originally released. I mean, it's damned obvious, even from still pictures. The screen now scrolls around a bit since it's smaller and I swear Harrier moves a bit slower. There are now only 12 stages instead of 18. To add a touch of challenge, they now put you back at the beginning of the stage when you continue. They give you a limited number of continues, but they also give you an easy to memorize password when you run out. So, I, whatever. They did redo the music in stereo though, and it doesn't sound bad. This version's okay, but I'd still much rather play the Master System port. But if you've ever wondered what it'd be like playing Space Harrier after dropping some acid, you know, play it on the Game Gear. G-Lock Air Battle was a launch game for the system that I never saw in action until now, and the first impressions here are not very good. Basically, you have dumb missions like shoot down 10 planes or shoot down 10 boats and whatnot. It doesn't matter which 10 planes or boats, just as long as you meet your quota. I guess maybe the game is about population control of the enemy? I, I don't know. The action is very slow and hard to control. Between rounds, you can upgrade your plane with the points that you earn. Even on the beginner mode, the game is very difficult as it's so easy to run out of fuel, which of course doubles as your armor. Some interesting animation of the background is all that this one really has going for it. I bet some of you are wondering how the Game Gear version of Mega Man is. And the ones who aren't, well, I'm going to talk about it anyway. This one was released only in North America by the brilliant masters at US Gold. It takes some aspects of Mega Man 4, 5, and 2, believe it or not. Utilizing the unparalleled power of the Game Gear, you can select from a whopping four stages right off the bat. The first thing you'll notice is that the screen often scrolls vertically when you jump, and this is super weird for a Mega Man game. Why does it do this? Well, because these stages were designed for the NES and the screen here is a lot smaller. And as a result of this tiny screen, you'll also have some blind jumps to deal with. The game plays okay, but it just doesn't feel quite right. It'd be a lot better if the stages were designed with this screen size in mind, like the Game Boy versions. Hell, seriously, they should have taken stages from those and colorized them instead of the NES games. Still, there is some decent platforming action here as well as lots of challenge. The graphics are done pretty well and everything looks nice. Even the music is pretty good. This is the best Mega Man game on the Game Gear. It's also the only one. Echo the Dolphin even made an appearance on the system in 1993. This is a port of the Master System version where the levels are slightly different and you have some different quests to do to unlock the path that you need to follow. Since there's only two buttons on the Game Gear, the start button is used for Echo Sonar. The one button is Dash and the two button swims. The game is still fun to play, but damn the music has taken a turn for the worse. I guess the music in every version of the game is ruined after you've heard the Sega CD music. Still, if you need your Echo fix, this game will do.
Echo Ties of Time came out a year later. It's like the first game where the objectives are overall similar, but the puzzles and paths are different. I like that you can morph into other sea creatures throughout your adventure. All the controls have remained the same as the first game, and that's okay. Hitting start for sonar is still weird at first, but you do get used to it pretty quickly. The graphics are okay, but I wish there was a little bit of detail in the backgrounds and not just a solid blue of the sea. And again, the music is just... Mm, not good. Devilish got a port on the Game Gear. This tells the story of a prince and princess who were turned into paddles of stone by a jealous demon. All of a sudden, a blue sphere dropped from the sky and was capable of destroying the evil demon's armies. What a great story for a breakout style game. You control the two paddle people and use them to break your way through each level. The cool thing is that you can change the orientation of the paddles four different ways to serve your needs. This is good because the game boards scroll both vertically and horizontally. Each board has a time limit, and if you don't finish the level in time, it's game over. Fortunately, it's not too difficult to finish a board in the allotted time. The game comes complete with a few boss fights here and there. While they're interesting, there's not a lot of challenge since the bosses can't harm you. They shoot projectiles at you, but it's just for show. The real struggle is killing them within the time limit. The control is pretty good, but not perfect. There's been many times where the blue ball slipped right through the first paddle when it's coming at you. Graphically though, I think the Game Gear is capable of better. There's a few areas that look great, but overall it's just, well, there. As far as the music goes, it's good, but not nearly as good as the one on the Genesis. Imagine that. Still, it's a fun game and worth a try. This game even got a sequel on the DS back in 2005. The Game Gear even got its own version of Ninja Gaiden. Like every other version of Ninja Gaiden, this one is pretty much its own unique game. But it does share some things with the first NES version, like sticking to walls every chance he gets. And some of the special powers are similar, like this Ring of Fire. But Ryu feels awkward to control, like the character is too lanky or something. Honestly, that's really the best way I can describe it. I feel like he should be a slightly smaller sprite. Also, he bounces back a bit when he gets hit, and you can get stuck in this sometimes. Your secondary weapons are limited by the amount of force that you have, which is shown in the top right of the screen. You use these by pressing down an attack. One exciting feature is that when you die fighting a boss, you get to start all the way over from the very beginning of the stage. Only good games do this. Well, and I guess this one. Batman Returns is one that sure surprised the hell out of me. The Genesis version, which is also made by Sega, is absolutely horrid. So imagine my surprise when I discover that this game is actually good? In fact, I might even say it's excellent. What the hell's going on here? Obviously, you play as Batman. You have a boomerang attack, which reminds me of one of the weapons in the NES version of the original game. What's cool about this, though, is that at any time you can change the strength of this weapon. So you can have a long throw, but it's rather weak, or a short throw, which is much stronger. Of course, the normal throw is right in the sweet spot, and it's good enough for most situations. If you press jump again while you're in the air, you'll extend your grappling hook. This will latch onto any ceiling type structure, and you can use it to swing around or jump up levels. However, you can only jump through thin floors. Lastly, you have a special item which will call in the Batmobile, or hell, even the Batski Boat for a special super strong attack. Throughout each level are bats which you can shoot that'll drop extra health or a special attack item. What's also interesting is that each stage gives you a choice of which route you want to take. Both routes are similar, but the stages are arranged differently. Route 2, I find, tends to be slightly more tricky than Route 1. Both, however, will end up at the same boss fight. The graphics are really nice, and I like how colorful everything is, yet still feeling kind of gloomy like Batman should. The music is also quite enjoyable and only makes the game better. This game is very satisfying to play, and it's leagues superior than the cruddy Genesis version. Tempo Jr. is the sequel to the 32X masterpiece. And of course, it's still a platformer. Your Tempo, a bug who's really into music. 
The levels are quite large and you need to find this keynote icon to reveal the exit. The enemies can be defeated or stunned by throwing notes at them, and bouncing on their head always kills them, and they get what they deserve. Many enemies will leave notes behind which fill up your life gauge. The CD icon adds a lot of life. The other items allow you to do a few different things. The flat icon makes the notes that you shoot fly downwards. The sharp icon, I'm sorry, I mean Twitter hashtag makes the notes fly upwards. And of course the zigzag icon makes them zigzag. Sometimes the screen will get dark and Temple will look all sad and stuff. Well, just kick this thing to turn the sunlight back on and cure your depression. Oh man, if only life really were that simple. After every two stages, you'll fight a boss. These guys are generally pretty easy. Hell, the entire game is really easy. It's almost impossible to die. Even the bottomless pits won't kill you. At least that's what I think they are. I don't know if they're supposed to be something else. But the game runs at a snail's pace. I feel that this one wasn't programmed as well as it could have been and it is wrought with slowdown. But still, this is a decent game for the younger set. All right, and that's the Game Gear for you. Dave, what are your final thoughts on the Sega Game Gear? Well, Joe, since we got this RGB modded system, my impression of the Game Gear has gone up through the roof. <laughs> the games are actually fun to play on an actual TV. I mean, I hated this system back in the day because of the washout screen. You just couldn't tell what the heck was going on, but now playing it this way brings a whole new level of awesomeness to it. What about you? I like it a lot better for a lot of the same reasons. Um, I like being able to play it on a TV. Mm -hmm. I think you can get a screen replacement and get a new screen. Mm -hmm. uh, that also increases the battery life if you get uh, an LED backlight. But the RGB thing, playing it on the TV is, is awesome. Yeah, and it's true because I'm actually going to have my Game Gear modified to output RGB video. So. You should. Mm -hmm. And what do you guys think? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameZack. And hopefully they did that on the game gear through the little TV connector thing. Yeah, that would be awesome if you have the TV connector thing. Game set. Game gear set. <laughs>